folks. We have one order of business today, but it's an important one and a really interesting one. Uh, we do have a quorum. I'd like to acknowledge we do have a quorum as well. Uh, today we're going to be doing a confirmation hearing for our friends at the Board of Animal Health. So we're going to have a chance to talk about each one of these individuals, their accomplishments, their capacity, uh, and then our um, uh, intention members is to uh, move all of them together to the floor as a slate uh, for confirmation on the floor of the Senate. Uh, so let's start off, if we could, Ms. Sawatsky, if you would, please. Uh, come to the table, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Putnam. <clears throat> My name is Erica Swatsky. I'm a sixth generation turkey, corn, and soybean farmer from Kensington. Uh, my family started back in 1866 when my great-great-great-grandfather homesteaded our farm after fighting in the Civil War. For many, uh, many years, my family uh, operated as a turkey breeder farm, uh, producing a little over a million uh, eggs per year. So the hens on our farm uh, laid eggs that we sold to a hatchery, and then that hatchery uh, sold those eggs to um, turkey farmers that were raising turkeys for meat. Uh, due to lots of changes within the industry, um, losing a partial barn to snow load, uh, farm transition, and then um, uh, labor shortages, we actually switched to the other side of the industry in 2020. So my family and I, um, we now raise light hens, um, is what we refer to them as. <clears throat> and so we get those baby turkeys, uh, they're called poults, when they're one day old and we will raise them until they're about 13 weeks of age. At that time, um, when they're ready to go to market, they will be about 14 pounds. So I often tell people that uh, that's the size of turkey that you would eat on Thanksgiving, but I think it's important to remember that we can eat turkey every day. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I farm uh, full time with my father, and then my husband is a high school agriculture teacher. And uh, so when he's not busy in the classroom or involved in FFA activities, he does help out on the farm. So um, really our, our passion and our roots are, are pretty deep in agriculture. Um, I was appointed to the Board of Animal Health in 2018 and completed full, uh, one full term and was reappointed to my second term. I currently serve as uh, president and I was just elected today um, again as president. So I'll be starting my third year as president for the Board of Animal Health. Um, as a farm who <clears throat> was recently impacted by uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, uh, I got to experience firsthand how we as a state respond to a foreign animal disease. So it really allowed me to wear my Board of Animal um, Health hat, but then also my, my farmer hat and see how we, we respond. And because of my role on the Board of Animal Health, um, it really has provided me the opportunity to use my experience to help other farmers that uh, are going through the same thing, um, board staff, and industry as a whole. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of the team that the board employs. We have, um, I think it's about 40 employees. Um, and so we do a lot with, uh, not very many people. Um, and so getting to experience that firsthand was, was pretty amazing because we hear about it um, during our quarterly board meetings, but to see uh, firsthand kind of on boots on the ground level was truly amazing. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Swatsky. Uh, members, do you have questions or comments for Ms. Swatsky? Senator Kunish. <laughs> Um, thank you for all your good hard work and, and the support of generations. Uh, have you, or when you were younger, did you ever think about doing anything other than working with your dad uh, in the turkey business? Ms. Zawatsky. Thank you, Chair Putnam and Senator Kunish. Um, Really good question. I actually grew up um, working at a vet clinic. So I, I always helped out on my family farm, um, but my intent was actually to go to school to be a large animal and an equine veterinarian. Um, so while I always appreciated my uh, my history and, and my background, and I never wanted to lose 
my tie to the farm. Um, I didn't know, you know, growing up that I would actually come back. And I think part of that is um, my father very intentionally didn't didn't push that on me. Um, he let me make that decision on my own, which I think is important um, that it wasn't forced. So I'm truly grateful for that. Members, any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Ms. Swatsky. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hawkins, uh, if you would, please. Please state your full name for the record. Commence your testimony when you're ready. Hi, I'm Peggy Ann Hawkins. And um, I had remarks, but I left them in the car. So I'll start with that. <laughs> um, thank you, and it's good to see everyone here today. I am a uh, livestock veterinarian. I graduated from Iowa State in uh, 1991. So I've been practicing as a livestock veterinarian for uh, 33 years now. That seems like a long time. Um, while I was in veterinary college, I did a, a concurrent degree and got a Master of Science degree in livestock production. It was really mostly pork and poultry. But um, so today, uh, what I know is pigs, and that's really my strength as a veterinarian. Um, <laughs> I uh, was uh, appointed to the Board of Animal Health in 2020, and so this is a reappointment. I really wanted to uh, continue working with the Board of Animal Health. It takes about two years of quarterly meetings to really get a handle on what it is that a director on the Board of Animal Health is doing. I know what the Board of Animal Health does. I, I know boards of animal health call different things in different states, but I know what the state veterinarian does and the people who work with them. Um, but I feel like now I have um, more of an idea of how to help the Board of Animal Health um, uh, for future, uh, future things. Um, I also want to say that uh, the, the people on the Board of Animal Health, both the directors and the staff members, those who are boots on the ground, um, they work very hard and are very dedicated to doing what's right for the animal for doing what's right for the owner or the caretakers of those animals, and to do what's right for the, the um, people of Minnesota. So um, I feel like the work that we do here um, is very important. I'm very proud to know that um, Erica Swatsky is the president of the Board of Animal Health, and I think that's an important thing. As a, as a producer and an owner, someone who is financially tied to the animals. That's so very important. As a veterinarian, um, I'm all about animal health and all about um, doing what's right for, for the people. Um, I want to feed people, and uh, that comes natural to, naturally to me uh, through my work as a Peace Corps volunteer in Lesotho, Africa for three years. So. Um, as I look back at, at everything I've done in my life, this is one way to give back. And I think uh, we need to, uh, well, I'd like to con continue doing that. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Members, do you have any questions or comments? Senator Kunish. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you, Ms. Hopkins. You mentioned that um, you want to help the body of animal, the Board of Animal Health. Do you have uh, like long-term goals, or do you see things, or do you are there things that you would like to improve on, or change, or like down the road? Um, here's a, something that I would make a difference to improve um, animal health. Is there something that that you are really excited about, Dr. Hawkins? Thank you. Thank you for the question, and that was a part that I left out. <laughs> Um, the, a year, a little over a year, year ago, um, uh, I'm trying to think about this. Uh, it's not a, a, it's not a Bill of Rights. Um, what am I thinking? The bylaws. The bylaws thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> 
the, the bylaws uh, were written for the, the board of directors of the Board of Animal Health, which sometimes I get confused on whether we're, I don't get confused, but you know, sometimes we're talking about the Board of Animal Health, and sometimes it's just the directors on the Board of Animal Health. So uh, part of that was uh, the vice president is supposed to um, manage the state veterinarian or the executive director. And we just got started in doing that. And I think that process and the bylaws need to, to be written a little bit better so that we all know what we are supposed to do as directors. Um, that's why it took two years before I really figured out what this was all about. And so those kind of things. We talk about the board of directors as helping to direct the board of animal health. But we don't come to the Board of Animal Health and say, this is what you should do. The staff of the Board of Animal Health says, this is what we're going to do, or this is what we're planning to do. And it's up to the directors to say, that's a good direction, or you know, to lead, lead by following first, I guess. Um, and then the legislature also puts out the rules and, and things that the Board of Animal Health has to implement. And so as directors, uh, we see that. I almost feel that the, the directors are there also to protect um, the citizens that um, the Board of Animal Health in inspecting and in doing their job, the, the veterinarians or the, the people who serve, who are on the staff, they could get a little bit um, picky on somebody or, you know, um, sort of be unfair to an industry or unfair to an individual. And that's where we as citizens, as volunteers, as directors, would be the, the stopgap for that. We don't have to do that. There's nothing going on right now that, that says this board needs to, to put the brakes on anything. But I see where that's what part of what we have to do. And I think that uh, you know, being here for another four years will help to, to bring that out. Thank so. you, Dr. Hawkins. Senator Kush? Right. Members, any other questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Hawkins, you looking through your resume and shows here that you've been involved with practicing veterinary medicine since 2007 in Minnesota anyway. Yes. And, uh, but it goes back uh, where you were an ag teacher. Uh, and I'm just wondering, because when I went through FFA, mm -hmm. we never had a, a veterinarian come and speak to us about a possibility of going into veterinary medicine. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I got to college, after, after I spent six years in the Navy, came back, that uh, the ag teacher uh, at the vocational school I was at talked about veterinary medicine as a possibility of going into as a vocation. I'm just wondering, do you have any type of uh, interactions with, because of your background in FFAs, or I see 4-H projects, mm -hmm. which I was a part of, but uh, what about FFA? Uh, and I don't see that in, in any of your resume. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Uh, as far as FFA in particular goes, um, I am on the um, committee at uh, Bethel, not Bethlehem Academy in Faribault, and they have started an FFA um, as part of their, their um, high school, um, junior high and high school. So uh, that's about all I'm doing today. Um, when I was in high school, I was a future homemaker of America. Hmm. And I wasn't a future farmer, but I was a future homemaker. Um, so um, I have to say the, the teacher there in the, in the resume was uh, teaching agriculture in um, Lesotho, Africa, in the Peace Corps. And so I did that for three years and then came in and got into veterinary college. So I was about 10 years older than the average student in my veterinary class. And... Uh, um, just saying. <laughs> Mr. Chair. 
Senator Anderson. Ms. Hawkins, uh, I see more and more today than there was ever before, uh, going back to my days in FFA, most of, at least in Buffalo, most of the individuals in the classroom are female. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see very many young men wanting to go into the, and expanding, and I see more and more women wanting to get into uh, the agriculture and, and even farming uh, as a, a vocation. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have experience of women wanting to be involved with the veterinary practice. Dr. Hawkins. That's a fantastic question. <laughs> Um, I gave a, a talk at the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, uh, one of the keynote talks, uh, the Hogg Lecture, uh, named for Alex Hogg. And part of what I, I talked about was 80% of all veterinary students, I think it's 85% now, of all veterinary students in the United States and Canada are women. Okay. So you say, well, that's just veterinary medicine. But it's more than that. Because from what I understand and what I, I, I read it, uh, at that time, when you start a freshman in college, undergraduate college, and you have all your freshmen, it's mostly men. You get to the end of four years, it's more women graduating than men, or, or even. And this is today. And when you talk about going from undergraduate, from a bachelor's degree, into further degrees, by far more women are doing that. So I don't know what's happening with, with young men, why they don't want to go on and, and spend that extra time to become veterinarians, lawyers. You can see a lot more lawyers are becoming, are, are becoming women. That didn't come that out too. right. <laughs> a lot more, more women are becoming lawyers than there are men becoming lawyers these days. And I don't know what's happening, but it's a phenomenon that's out there. And um, those in higher education and maybe some of us uh, younger folks need to be talking to our children and uh, making it more palatable to, to go on to those things. So, yeah... Um, uh, there are a lot more women in these fields, and I think that will continue. Thank you. Uh, to to this, um, this question, I mean, the, there's also the concern, of, and this is, again, sort of external to our conversation here about uh, your suitability for the board, but it's an important question that Senator Anderson's raising, and that's the disposition of veterinarians across the state of Minnesota, in particular, mm -hmm. uh, large animal vets. And Senator Kupek and I gave a talk at um, the U, at their vet school. Mm -hmm. And there's, well, I exaggerate, I'm probably 100 people, but 100 people in the program. Right. And um, at the end of it, we asked them, how many of you intend to practice in greater Minnesota? And I think we got three hands mm -hmm. out of that 100. Yeah. Uh, so again, that's, a, that's another variable for us to address or another thing to think about. Um, and again, it's external to your responsibility here on the board. But if you could solve that one for us, that'd be great. <laughs> We'll see what we can do. Um, um, Senator Westrom, do you have a question? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I guess just, just maybe a comment and a response, but um, back to uh, the prior question, uh, I think it was Senator Kunish had asked. Um, but your response, uh, Ms. Hawkins, I just thought was noteworthy. Um, and I think just another uh, affirmation of why we go through a confirmation process, why we appoint people to boards, or why people are elected because of that. Um, your, your response, uh, to use the word, one of the words you used was, if, if, if the staff are getting too picky. Um, and and I, I think that's uh, eloquent. I mean, that's part of the idea of the board. We don't have robots. Uh, the people you're overseeing aren't robots. The cattle farmers and pig farmers and industry aren't robots, and there's humans involved. And so I just think that's something we got to always remember, but that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I was appreciated hearing that because sometimes I think we in government think we're going to drop the hammer and just fix everybody and everything, and it's just not that simple. And on the farm or in the industry as we're regulating and there's there's a point where 
you know, we all grew, grew up, uh, moms and dads can get too picky. And so it's, it's kind of uh, the balance that we need to find. But that's, appreciate hearing that. And uh, sounds like your board, you know, actively takes that to heart. And uh, I, I think that's a good thing because that's part of the process. We want objective people that are experienced and, and understand uh, the industry they're, they're overseeing, but it's their colleagues. It's their people they work with on a day in and day out basis. So just just wanted to make that feel free to offer any further comments. On Dr. That. Hawkins. Yeah, I would like to, to offer one comment and that is, I'm gonna do this anyway. Um, I feel we need to be careful that we don't legislate how people raise their animals or how people do their job it's good to, to, to legislate and say, look, we need to protect people. So, um, you know, the, the amount of uh, insecticides you're going to use or, or things like that in general, in general, you can say what you're gonna do with your hog manure. Yeah, we need to make sure people are handling hog manure right. But if you get right down to the nitty gritty picky stuff, um, once you make a law, it's hard to change when you realize that newer technology has just come out and you're stuck. Um, and running farms by committee is not necessarily a good idea. Um, I wanna say right now, every farmer I've ever met, and I really know hog farmers, they are some of the most patient people you will meet. Hogs don't move unless they want to. And sometimes because of, the, of, uh, of uh, the females when they're in heat, the greater power decided that they won't move if you touch them on the back, right? Um, so hog farmers are very patient individuals. Dairy farmers are very observant individuals. These are great people who are doing a great job and they don't necessarily need to be told what to do. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Members, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Okay. Uh, Dr. Copian Fox, uh, if you would please. Uh, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready, please. Great, I am Dr. Jessica Copian Fox. I usually go by Dr. Fox and I am from Southwest Minnesota. I grew up in Minneota, Minnesota, and I now live in Marshall, Minnesota. I wanted to be a veterinarian probably before I could pronounce veterinarian. I had, um, I'm an 80s kid, and I had that Fisher Price doctor's kit, and I said, I'm gonna be an animal doctor, and I don't know where it came from. It was implanted in the womb, I guess. So um, I just always knew that's what I wanted to be. I uh, had wonderful patient veterinarians that allowed me to start shadowing very early, Dr. Scott Josephson in Taunton and then um, Dr. Tim Hunt. So I've just kind of always known that's what I wanted to do. And uh, interestingly, I love fish. And I was always very frustrated with the local veterinarians that wouldn't treat fish. And I said, well, when I'm a veterinarian, I'm gonna treat fish. And everybody kind of said, well, good, good luck with that. Um, so when I got into veterinary school here in Minnesota, I realized there was not fish, so I had to find uh, other opportunities. <laughs> but I'm now a certified aquatic veterinarian, and some of you may have seen me before. I've testified a couple times, both in the House and the Senate, for shrimp. So I'm the Minnesota shrimp vet. So, um, yeah. It's a true story. <laughs> uh, so I may be one of the most mixed animal doctors you'll maybe ever meet. I, when other classmates had kind of an easy year, third year, I was crazy busy because I was taking all the electives. So I've, I've worked in uh, human food. I've worked in uh, industry with animal feed, uh, mixed animal practice. I've done some work with zoos and aquariums. And I um, have served on the M Minnesota Veterinary Medical Association board. I'm currently serving on this board. I've served on uh, American Veterinary Medical Association Aquaculture Aquatic Veterinary Medicine Committee. And I'm currently on a council for the AVMA. And I'm just really passionate about rural 
medicine and agriculture and what we can do to continue to support people in, in rural areas and continue to support rural veterinarians and ensure that our food supply is protected. I'm passionate about domestic agriculture and aquaculture and just really being cognizant of supporting our, our production here in the U.S. and growing that. Any questions for me? Thank you, Dr. Vox. I, I, I do have to apologize for my obvious incredulity. When you said that you were a, a, a shrimp vet, um, and I looked at you like, as if. Um, <laughs> but I do have a question about How do you tell when a shrimp is sick? And what do you do about it? I've had this question before. Thank you, uh, Chair Putnam. Um, I actually, last time, I said, well, I have an extremely small stethoscope. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's, it's herd health, right? And um, so I, my favorite is babies. I love, love, love the babies, and that's microscope work. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, but the, the big ones, um, it's, it's also doing some micros microscope work and just kind of looking herd health-wise. Yeah, it's a little bit more difficult with fish and shrimp than it is with, with other livestock. So That's fascinating. Uh, members, do you have any uh, questions or comments for Dr. Fox? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Fox. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here today, and thank you for your service on the Animal Health Board. I truly do appreciate it. Could you tell me what would be one of your biggest concerns Gary, dealing your with animal health? Sorry about that. What would be one of your biggest concerns dealing with animal health uh, it could be from a standpoint of legislation, it could be a standpoint of disease or whatever. What, what are some of your biggest concerns? Dr. Fox. Senator Deems, that's a big question. <laughs> that's probably a question I have to answer carefully. Um, I'm just going to formulate a thought to say it appropriately. I. I think we just need to be careful when we make decisions of other outcomes that might happen. We, we had a discussion actually today at the Board of Animal Health and, and the questions I usually ask are because even though people introducing bills might have good intentions, there are entities that have nefarious um, priorities, I'd say, <laughs> and, and motives. And I think um, one, one of the problems, and, and I don't know if this is necessarily animal health, but I think it can be, but also just agriculture, is just we're, we're in silos and very segmented. And I think even with veterinary medicine, um, I, I really try to pull people together because of the variety of my experiences. And I see things happening in multiple sectors. Um, and that's kind of why I talk about aquaculture. I've seen on the West Coast producers that have been in making fish <laughs> production for 40 years, and they're amazing. And they have actually amazing impacts on the ecosystem. Aquaculture can be tremendous for the environment, as well as sustainability and our food supply. And I can go on a big tangent because the stuff that comes in is not safe. It's not always safe, and the FDA can't check it all, right? But decisions get made that can shut those people's businesses down. and. Decisions are made sometimes in one sector that we might think, well, that's, that's killer whales. That has nothing to do with agriculture. But it does because some people play the long game. And ultimately, I believe that animal health decisions should be with the animal caretakers and their veterinarians. I do not believe that animal health on like an individual, individual care perspective should be legislated because that, that, that should be just like your health should be between you and your doctor. The health of animals should be between veterinarians and their, their clients and their patients. And so I just think we, the biggest threat I see is more on the lines of like, just, I don't know, our food supply and, and, and protecting it more along the lines of just being careful with decisions that we make, looking about how that might be setting a precedent that could then impact our, our pork production, our, our cattle production, our poultry production. Um, just a really quick example, um, at MVMA Governmental Affairs Committee, my first one, um, if, if Corey Bennett is here, he can attest. Um, it's a big committee, it was my first one, and they, they were talking about uh, gas chambers. So all of you will now know my opinion on the matter. <laughs> but um, it, it was to, 
the wording was um, that it is inhumane. And that is something that is used in research. It's used for, um, it's carbon dioxide chambers to, to euthanize animals. It's an AVMA approved method. And um, it, if I used euthanasia solution on a chicken in research, we wouldn't be able to eat that chicken, right? Like it's inedible afterwards. So there are tools that we use that are humane. And that was introduced and it could have had a huge impact, but it was introduced as, oh, it's just for dogs and cats. But that's not how it was written. And so, that kind of raised a red flag with me and I, I raised my hand like, excuse me, <laughs> I, I see a problem with this. And so I think even though it seemed like, oh, this is just for companion animals, it was written in a way that it would have impacted agriculture and it would have been impacted my ability to provide a humane end to animals in, in research that are gonna impact the, the food supply. So I just think that's, that's a big threat that I see is just making sure we're really cognizant with the decisions that we we make on a whole. Well, thank you, Dr. Fox. I appreciate your answer. Members, any other questions for Dr. Fox? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, member is virtual uh, with us today. Um, Mr. Stade, Stad, if you would please um, unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alex Stady. Um, sorry I couldn't be there. I'm at the National Land Native Land Staff Conference in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I am a member of the Shakopee Milwaukee Sioux community. I'm a beef producer. Uh, I've grown up on a dairy farm, a hog farm, and now my wife, daughter, and stepson and I uh, own and operate a uh, beef cattle farm. So we. Uh, we show cattle around the nation, here in the state fair, all that stuff. So, you know, I just, yeah, greatly appreciate your guys' time today. Thank you, Mr. Steady. Uh, members, any questions or comments for Mr. Steady? Seeing none, um, go back to Vegas. <laughs> Thank you. Go, ha go have some fun, sir. We're all done. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, Mr. Neal, if you would, please. Uh, could you come to the desk, state your full name for the record, commence testimony when you're ready, please. Thank you, Senator Putman. Uh, my name is Stephen Neal from Northfield. I'm a beef cattle producer. Uh, we are a seed stock operation. We raise registered Hereford cattle. Um, we have about a a hundred brood cows. Um, we uh, we market our top end heifer calves at an open house and online sale in the fall in the first part of October. We uh, we keep about uh, ten to fifteen bulls every year that we sell private treaty off the farm in the spring. Um, the, the rest of the male calves are all fed out on our farm, and uh, we sell about twenty to twenty five head as free freezer beef throughout the year. Uh, the rest of the cattle are all sold through the uh, sale barn in Cannon Falls. Um, I was asked by a good friend to uh, apply for this position on the uh, Board of Animal Health. I didn't have a whole lot of familiarity with the board when I started, other than uh, Dr. Hartman would usually check our health papers at the Minnesota State Fair, so I knew who he was. But uh, other than that, I didn't know a whole lot about this, and I've, I've been on it for a year now. We started last July, and uh, so I've been to four quarterly meetings and uh, really enjoying it and learning quite a bit about uh, high path avian influenza that I would have never known anything about, but really enjoying my time and getting a little bit more comfortable with every meeting. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Neal. Questions for Mr. Neal? Senator Western. Um, Mr. Chair, um, I don't mean this to be an unfair question, so at all I'm just asking your thoughts, and I thought I should have maybe asked it early on, and others could address it with the veterinarian side of things, just with the avian influenza that you brought up. Um, just, just any any thoughts of where we're at with uh, avian flu and concerns for the spring? Is it high, low? I've been reading some articles just recently that there's been some new transmission between birds and dairy cattle and a goat in my district 
not dairy cattle in my district yet, but a goat in Stevens County in Minnesota um, is, is being presumed to have the avian influenza um, transfer to, to, to those animals. And so just, just thoughts on that. I'm, I'm not, don't, you don't have to go deep, but I know the veterinarians would have a thought on it too. And others that come up might. Uh, just, just, just any quick thoughts on that, no, Mr. Neal? If you, if you would, just have your initial thoughts. You can also phone a friend uh, if you'd like to. <laughs> uh, we met earlier this morning, and it certainly was a uh, topic of conversation. Um, certainly, um, it's changing hourly. You know, it's there are more and more reports of it in dairy cattle, um, and my my thought is, I'm really glad it's not in beef cattle yet, um, but. Uh, with with the migrating birds, it's it's just something that we're going to have to deal with. And uh, the uh, Board of Animal Health and uh, Shauna Voss's staff out in uh, Wilmer have done just a wonderful job uh, taking care of it when we do have it in the state. And uh, they are, they, yeah, they do a wonderful job, and we're very lucky to have them in charge of that stuff. And if it does get into dairy cattle here, and uh, I'm sure there will be a response equal to that with them. Um, Dr. Hafes has joined us at the, the table, the state veterinarian. Uh, if you'd like to take a swing at this as well, that we'd, we'd very much appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Chair Putnam, uh, Senator Westrom, that's, uh, the, the million dollar question, I think, is what's going on with, with high path these days. And you've, you've keyed in on some of our, our concerns, the, the latest with uh, the dairy cattle that are testing positive for highly pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, currently, our, our status in the, in the poultry realm is and everyone knock on wood with me, is, is pretty quiet. We've had three cases since the beginning of the year. They've all been backyard flocks. Uh, no, no cases in commercial poultry operations in Minnesota yet this year. Uh, nationwide, I think we're at 21 cases in commercial uh, poultry uh, facilities. So kind of on track with where we were at last spring. Um, so much, much less than we saw in the spring of 22, more in line with what we saw in 23. Um, we all know things can change overnight. So as, as you alluded to, the, the strange occurrences that we're finding, the, uh, the positive cases in goat kids in, in Stevens County that was attributed to one of our backyard flocks that tested positive came out of nowhere. So that was, uh, that was a curveball that I don't think anyone in the country saw, let, let alone the world. Uh, I actually had an email this morning from England asking for more information because they suspect they have something similar happening over there. Um, and, and then move forward a couple weeks after that and we get the, the news from, from Texas. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of information circulating. Some of it is uh, speculation. Some of it is still, still waiting to be uh, confirmed. So um, just, just trying to determine what, what exactly this all means. Why are we finding highly pathogenic avian influenza in uh, milk from dairy cattle? Um, when asked that question, I, I've been telling people it's because we're looking for it. Uh, so the, the question is, has it always been there? Are we, are we not looking at all dairy cattle? Maybe, maybe this is just something that is in the environment and our dairy cattle are, are exposed to it, much like other domestic species. And uh, the reason we detected it in these Texas dairy cattle is because they had a, a mystery cattle syndrome that they were dealing with. So uh, cattle that were showing kind of nonspecific signs of illness, going off feed, um, uh, tacky manure, the uh, milk consistency was, was changing. So um, frankly, they were trying to, trying to figure out what is causing this, and, and they stumbled across uh, avian influenza in the milk. So that's, that's the update I have. And, and as I said, this changes overnight. I, I gave a briefing to the um, House Ag Committee, and I had to change my slide decks overnight <laughs> because things change that quickly. So. Um, it's, it's an evolving situation. We're working very closely with uh, our partners at the Department of Ag, Department of Health, as well as the, the USDA to keep on top of this, uh, working closely with University uh, Dairy Extension and uh, Minnesota Milk, just to make sure everyone's at the table, everyone's talking, and we're, we're doing what we can to keep, keep milk safe, keep uh, consumers of milk safe. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Senator Weston. Mr. Chair, thank you, and uh, thank you, Dr. Um, just, just to keep this short, I mean, everything I've read so far is it, it, it doesn't have the effect on cattle or, or goats as poultry, where poultry, the, 
the cure is death. Um, seems like cattle are, I mean, it's kind of like the more of a traditional flu. You go through some sickness period of time and they recover. Is that is that kind of in a short summary uh, the way to go? And maybe there's another time to have more discussion on this. But Dr. Hayes, uh, Chair Putnam, Senator Westrom, that's that's correct. So uh, the other thing I need to highlight is we can't even say for sure that this virus is causing disease in these cattle. So I think by default we've we've categorized the the mystery cattle disease being caused by highly pathogenic avian influenza. That has not been proven yet. Uh, but to your point, the, the condition has not resulted in any mortalities in cattle. Um, so whatever this, this underlying cause of, of the condition we're seeing in the cattle, they seem to recover within uh, 10 to 14 days and return to the, the milking herd. So you're, you're exactly right. It's, it's not a, a fatality event, a uh, high mortality like we see in, in poultry. Dr. Harris, I actually have a, something of a follow-up question on this one, which you, I, I, we may not have figured this out yet, but is there a sense in that um, the dairy cattle who have contracted this have gotten it from commercially produced turkey, or is it ducks getting into the cattle zone? Does that uh, make sense? Kind of. <laughs> so it, are, I, they, are I they getting it from saying. other livestock, or, or is it the same means of transmission that's coming from waterfowl who are coming from off the, the um, farm? So, Chair Putnam, the, the, the virus has been sequenced to, to show that it's the same virus, basically, that's circulating in migratory birds. So the assumption is that it has been introduced into these dairy cattle at, uh, in various states from uh, migratory birds. Um, there's, there's still question out there if the cattle themselves are transmitting it. There's a, um, an unusual case uh, in Michigan, in particular, where some cattle from one of these affected farms were imported into Michigan, and then cattle that were already in Michigan were the ones that actually tested to uh, have the virus in the milk. So um, the suspicion is that maybe there was a transmission, lateral transmission of some kind between cattle. Hasn't been proven yet. I've, I've got USDA folks suggesting that's the case, and I've got Michigan state officials saying that is not the case. So uh, the jury's still out. I, I, I would suspect just because we are not seeing a, a uh, overwhelming um, infection rate in cattle that if, if it is lateral, it, it's maybe maybe fomite based. So by that I mean maybe it's maybe it's being car carried mechanically by something or someone. If if the if the farm workers um, in, unintentionally are spreading that virus, potentially the milking equipment, those are all just theories that haven't haven't been proven yet. But um, to date, it's it's been uh, the initial introduction was attributed to migratory waterfowl. There's actually some some research coming out as they continue doing the sequencing on the DNA, they get further out, they're recognizing there's some, some different changes that might indicate it's multiple introductions. So not just one, one farm, one, one case of uh, migratory birds, but multiple, might, multiple different flocks of birds potentially could be involved. Thank you, Dr. Hess. Member, any other questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Neal and, and Dr. Hafes for your uh, expertise. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Schaefer, if you would, please. Please state your full name for the record and uh, commence testimony when you're ready. Good afternoon, Senator Putnam and the committee. My name is Brandon Schaefer. I'm a beef and pig farmer in Goodhue. I'm a sixth generation family farmer. Um, been doing this all my life, as well as the the five generations that came before me that set the groundwork for me to have a footstep and a path to follow. Um, I guess my my passion for agriculture and passion for the future of agriculture, and as as a theme of my wife and I's theme of our our decisions in our our family, um, I guess our family board, if you will, is we're we're charged with making decisions and putting forth good processes for the people that we may never ever meet. And that's that's coming with a legacy mentality of my generation eight, nine, ten, who knows where it might end up. Um, that that's what drives me every day. And the uh, one of the reasons that I, I accepted the challenge when when some of my colleagues in the in the pig industry asked me to step forward to to accept this this opportunity and put my name in the in the hat um, to to be considered is is simply to look f 
to preserve an industry of, of animal agriculture, which is a foundation to our, our rural economic vitality. And we talked a little bit about veterinary medicine and the lack thereof of large animal veterinarians. And I think that the issue goes much, much deeper than just how do we talk a student into becoming a large animal veterinarian in a, in a rural community. I think we have to build rural communities that it, it invite those powerful minds to come back and build a family and a legacy for themselves within those rural communities. And I think it's it behoove of us as, as decision makers here in 2024 to make sure we, we consider all the foundational elements of those things that we create in terms of legislative actions um, and just core decisions, whether it's my spot on the Board of Animal Health or, or my, my role as a, a leader in our farm business, that we consider the the impact of the decisions that we make each and every day. And whether that's, in, and I'm going to kind of step back to the the animal, Board of Animal Health role, and, and our role as, as directors is, is all-encompassing. It's an animal, it, it's our jurisdiction, whether that's a aquaculture to pigs, cows, horses, cats, dogs, the list goes on and on and on. And I think it, it's be paramount for us to consider as we see things come across all of our desks, whether it's in our realm at the board level or your realm at the legislative level, is to consider the, the impacts of some of the decisions that are before us is what collateral results might come that will have unintended consequences to those. And, I, and I'm thinking probably selfishly as an ag, ag and a livestock producer to allow us, if we, if we legislate things in the dog and cat realm, what spillover impact that may have in, in either li literally or socially to the future of agriculture and animal agriculture in general. So that, that's one thing that I guess I consider as I sit in my role in the, in the board um, is not only how does this affect the hat that I wear today, and sometimes we need to check our hat at the door and consider the greater, greater good. Um, so yeah, that's that's what drives me is the passion for that. Those people that none of us will have the pleasure to ever know. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, members, questions or comments for Mr. Schaefer? Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I see you have been a wrestling coach in the past. I have. Thank you. Were you at the state tournament this year? I am sorry to say I did not get to go to the state <laughs> tournament this year. Never mind, that's fine. I, I, <laughs> Does that mean he's out, Senator Anderson? No, I mean, no, I no. Just wonder if he's wrestling bulls or anything like that. But I see in, in your uh, resume, though, it, uh, and I've never heard of this, d d this uh, type of cattle, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, Gelvia? I don't know if I'm even close to saying that right, but what is that breed of cut cow? Sure. Mr. Schaefer. Animal. Chairman Putnam and committee and Senator Anderson. Um, it's, it's pronounced Gelpfi, and it's a German-French breed in, in, in Europe. Um, it, was, it was brought into the States in the migration of the continental breeds um, generations ago in 70s, 1970s, I guess, would probably be the, the primary influx. Um, in Europe, they're a, a dual-purpose breed, both dairy and beef. Um, highly fertile, highly maternal animal that has, has made a, a splash within the industry. Um, not necessarily the mainstay. It's not an Angus or Hereford, but it's, it's accentuated some of the traits that those breeds might bring to the table, in, in which why we use it in combination with an Angus. Senator Anderson. Mr. Chair, uh, so is this breed considered maybe more resistant to disease or more has other characteristics built into the breed that make it more advantageous one way or the other. I, I don't, that breed's not a, a well-known breed here in Minnesota that I understand, but I'm wondering why, why that, uh, if, what, what the characteristic is of that breed that makes it so advantageous for you and maybe others to want to be a part of that. Yeah. Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Chairman and Senator Anderson, um, very good question. Um, I wasn't the, the decision maker, that was my dad's role back 50 years, 55 years ago when he decided to, to pursue that, that breed. And, and what attracted us was the, the Mark Data Minnesota, or the Meat Animal Research Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. And to this date, um, annually, it still is the, the 
highest yielding, greatest fertility beef animal in the research studies um, in that it, it will yield more pounds of calf weaned of any cow, pounds of cow exposed. So therefore it's highly efficient, highly fertile, um, the youngest animal to puberty. So we, we experience great um, reproductive results and that's what drives, drives us to continue with that. That is a component of our breeding program. So Mr. Chair. St. Anderson. So um, as you're coming to the Board of Animal Health, do you see this as part of a, a, a foundation for your being a part of the board or as far as what you have on your farm? Mr. Schaefer. Um, Chairman and Senator Anderson, um, yes and no. I think the, my, my foundational drive to mm -hmm. be a, a part of the, the board is, is more about ensuring that we, we lay a foundational security for animals of all species and both farmed as well as companion to have a place in our societal and professional roles, especially in rural communities. Um, as, we, as I travel across the, the Midwest in, in my other elements of my role, we're also in the swine business and I would say that's the larger component of our business today. Um, and we provide a lot of breeding stock to the industry. And one of the mantras of our, our family farm is we do for the industry what the industry might not be able to do for itself. And that being um, some things within the genetic side of, of the pig world, um, whether it's we do breeding projects and assisting other, others of my colleagues that are in the industry that may not be able to do, do large scale breeding projects to breed gills to repopulate their diseased farms, if you will. They want to depopulate, we will set up a herd to repopulate them. Um, we raise boars for, for the industry to, throughout, the indus for, throughout the United States um, that, that sit in stud that will be used to make the pigs and the pork that we produce. We, we all enjoy, I hope we all do. Um, and just the list goes on and on. So I think there's so many things. It's more than just animal health. It's an animal industry. And it's an animal economic element of our societal vitality to, to pursue it. As, and as I mentioned earlier, my, my travels throughout the Midwest through, with the, the genetic piece of our pig side is as you enter into the communities that have animal agriculture, and I would argue even furthermore the anim ruminant animal agriculture, that it's a vibrant community. You go into the communities that don't have animal agriculture as a component of its economic activity, there's far less vitality on Main Street. And it's because of the, the people and the uh, elements that go into those industries that provide employment and where you have employment, you have families. Where you have families, you have students. Where you have students, you have an active school. And all those things bring communities together and you maintain the churches and everything else that goes into play. And as we become much more of an urbanized society and the less and less activity that we see from a representation and that understand those elements of agriculture, the less likely we are to pursue and maintain an economic vitality that's critically important to the generations to come. Thank you. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Schaefer. What do you think will have the biggest impact in your operation in the next 10 years? Mr. Schaefer. Wow. Chairman and Senator Dames. Um, that's a fantastic question. The next 10 years, uh, number one, we, we in the pig industry, we have the looming worry of African swine fever and a, a foreign animal disease. Um, that set aside, and let's presumptively say we can keep that off our shores, um, I think it's going to be labor and our ability to maintain the, the labor force that we need to operate in a modern day society of production agriculture. As, as agriculture continues to scale um, and there's less and less of us that are actively involved as entrepreneurs and it's not because we don't want the others with us. It just becomes an economic vitality element of can we continue to remain sustainable. Um, that's going to be the biggest challenge of, of the generations that come before me. My, I've got two kids in the business with me that one is 25 and one is 27 and will they be doing the same thing the same way I do when they're my age? I absolutely for guarantee they will not. 
um, it's going to be their their ability to continue to recruit and maintain good people to assist them in managing the business that they hopefully will pass on the legacy to other generations. Thank you. Members, any other questions for Mr. Schaefer? All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Last, we have um, Dr. Maynard. Dr. Maynard, if you would please. State your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready, please. Thank you, Chair Putnam. My name is Dr. Abigail Maynard, and I am a veterinarian in St. Paul, specifically in Oakdale. Uh, I have been a veterinarian since 2017, and I've wanted to be a veterinarian since I was the age of five. I wrote down in a little tiny journal in my very terrible handwriting, I want to be an animal doctor. My mom still has that piece of paper at home. <laughs> I started volunteering at vet clinics at the age of eight, thankfully, and I had been volunteering up until the age of 16 where I decided maybe I wanted to earn money on my summers <laughs> when I was old enough to. Um, and I've been head over heels for veterinary medicine ever since, um, which I think you might be able to tell from my resume. I involve myself in quite a lot of different aspects of veterinary medicine, and I just am truly passionate about it. And I try to share that passion with as many people as possible. So in my free time, I speak to students at a variety of ages in different schools. And then I try to volunteer in a variety of different things, serving on the Minnesota Veterinary Medical Association in a variety of roles. And also just volunteering abroad and different things that I can do with my uh, degree, as I truly believe I was made to be a veterinarian. This is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Um, with the Board of Animal Health, I'm the newest member. <laughs> I've only actually been on the board since November of last year. Um, but I'm not new to the board. I actually uh, did an externship with the board in 2016. I also did an externship with the Department of Health, uh, the USDA APHIS, and FSIS. And I mention all of that because now, as a member of the board, I get to see all of those people and all of those organizations working together. And for me, that is like just the biggest joy because I learned all of these individual parts, but now as a member of the board, I'm able to see just how uniquely privileged the state of Minnesota is to have all of these parts working together because I truly believe that is a unique benefit to the, that the state has that not very many others do have. And I that's what I enjoy most is the little pieces of information that I have about each of those things and seeing how collaborative that environment is in Minnesota is what I enjoy most about being on the board. Thank you, Dr. Maynard. Um, members, questions, comments? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, Doctor, you mentioned uh, you volunteered where when you were young? I didn't quite catch that. Dr. Uh, Maynard. Thank you, Chair, Senator. Um, so I volunteered in a variety of places, um, but I guess most recently I would say that I volunteered in uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, and Namibia. Um, but when I was younger, I said I volunteered at vet clinics from the age of eight, so I'm not sure which volunteer experience. Thank you. The, the latter, I think you said vet clinics. I didn't, I wasn't, didn't make that out the first time, so thank you. Senator Kunish. Thank you. <clears throat> um, you you practice here in, in St. Paul, and it sort of looks to me like most of the other board members or directors are um, in greater Minnesota. Um, can you tell us how you maybe bring a unique voice to, to the board when discussing, you know, any of the issues that, that might come up in the, in the program or in the board? Dr. Maynard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, so I think, firstly, m my role at the board is specifically specializing in companion animals. So it's dogs and cats, like, you know, your pets. Um, and so for me, I believe that being in the Twin Cities, I have the highest volume of access to those pets being in the city area. But I believe my voice is unique in that that is not all I've ever done with my career. I've taken, I've tried really hard to be as rounded as I could be. And so for me, I think my voice is unique in that I just don't know dogs and cats. I know quite a bit of everything else. And that allows me to be better able to talk about dogs and cats because I have a bit of knowledge around all of the other species that I've worked with as well. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Maynard, you, were, you mentioned in your resume here 
that uh, at one clinic you did 85% small animal, 10% large animal, and 5% exotics. How does that relate to today in doing the same thing? And do you see that like exotics being that class that's growing? Dr. Maynard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I would say that it is a class that's growing in that there are more families seeking to have exotic pets. I no longer see exotics at this time, but from my knowledge and what I see with my friends that are also seeing exotics, uh, I would say that it is a growing proportion of families that are choosing to own exotic pets. Senator Anderson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just heard on the news the other day that there was somebody in Florida that got a was uh, bringing in monkeys from out of and found out that they were more problem than they were a benefit. So I was just looking at exotics, and that seemed like an exotic thing to be done. And, I, and I'm just curious as to what that field is looking like here in Minnesota. So thank you. Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will just say, as a proud former owner of three guinea pigs, guinea pigs are considered an exotic animal. And Senator Kupek, who has rescued four guinea pigs from a park, apparently, would understand that these are more common than you think in Minnesota. But I just wanted to say, all kidding aside, I do really, really appreciate the fact that you have a wide variety of animal care. Because it does, like, I mean, and I know, like, you know, hey, having a pet guinea pig is really, like, not... <laughs> like, a, like a big deal to like Minnesotans across the state. But I just, you know, it's tough. You can't find care because you specialized care is tough. You can find a dog or a cat vet on just about every city, um, at least here in like the metro area. But um, to find care for anything outside of that is really, really difficult. And those animals matter too. So um, I know your expertise goes far beyond just that. But I, I just wanted to say, I appreciate you. Your experience is great. And um, Guinea pigs are a wonderful pet, everybody. So, I got to say, now that we know this, we will be having another hearing on the hero Rob Kupak and his efforts to be, to save <laughs> guinea pigs around the world. We're going to have a whole hearing on that, I think, because that sounds pretty entertaining. Yeah. Right. Members, any other questions or comments for Dr. Maynard, um, the guine friend of the guinea pig, Senator Kupak? <laughs> Absolutely, always. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And and I'm going to feel bad for asking this because I mean I look through your resume and all the volunteer work you've done and all the great things you've done, and I am instantly drawn to the section of other that includes a rat handler and competing in dog-powered sports, which are just uh, just maybe what are what, how, what what is a rat handler and what dog-powered <laughs> sports other than mushing of which is the only one I'm really familiar with. Dr. Maynard, if you would, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Putnam, and thank you, Senators. If I may, I would like to just offer um, one recommendation, Senator Gustafson, for guinea pig vets. Homey Gnome in Oakdale is amazing, and I would highly recommend them. <laughs> and, Senator, your question. Um, so I, my smaller breed dog, uh, he's a Cairn Terrier, love of my life. Um, he is a... Um, barn hunt champion so he has three titles in barn hunt and so barn hunt is a sport in which um, the rats are hidden in a hay bale basically it's a simulated farm and he basically just has to go and find them and tell me there's a rat right there and I have to be able to say okay this is a rat I say that out loud and um, the judges are able to say yes you're correct and then we do that and we have to find all of the rats and not call anything that's not a rat a rat um, I will say caveat these rats are well taken care of as a rat handler I can assure you that they are very well taken care of um, I am part of their care they love what they do they actually like jump like take me out let's go play um, when it's their turn to go and participate in this sport and so that's where I'm a rat handler um, my larger dog, uh, he participates in sled pulls, but not mushing. Um, he does sled pulls by weight. Um, and so to this day, his max weight pulled is 1,086 pounds. So um, he just has to pull X amount of times of his body weight by six feet. Um, and that's his max weight. Dr. Maynard. <laughs> A lot to talk about. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with how big is this thousand pound pulling dog? 
What, what kind of what kind of dog is it? He, he's uh, so I actually found him roaming the streets of St. Paul. Oh, sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, sure. I found him roaming the streets of St. Paul. Uh, so he is. I did a DNA test on him, and I call him my All American because he is thirty percent American Pit Bull Terrier, thirty percent American Bully, thirty percent American Bulldog, <laughs> and the other parts they didn't know. <laughs> um, and so he actually weighs seventy pounds. He's on a very strict regimen <laughs> because if he goes over seventy pounds, then he goes into a different weight class and that makes it harder for him because those dogs are pulling far more. But um, <laughs> he's 70 pounds um, and yeah, his max weight so far is, is that. <laughs> so Dr. Maynard, I, I'm sorry everybody, but um, <laughs> like, how do you train like a weightlifting dog? Like I, I'm imagining this 80s montage of like your, <laughs> your dog <laughs> training to pull a thousand pounds exactly <laughs> as Senator Kupek is doing. Uh, do you do a lot of training uh, of the dog or is he just naturally buffed? Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, so he was actually s severely underweight when I phoned him. So we went through a very, if you can't tell, I'm a bit fanatical when it comes to my pets. <laughs> um, and so we went through a very uh, determined regimen to get him up to weight. And then we... So he had a higher fat, less protein for a while to gain weight, and then he went to higher protein, less fat to maintain muscle. Um, in terms of exercise, yes, he does have a training regimen, which he all enjoys. This is, this is the thing that he loves the most. Um, and so first we had to get him used to wearing the harness, and then we got him used to having the harness and having weight. So how we started with that was just him wearing the harness and having fun, just playing around. And then I would put the harness on and attach it to myself, and then we would just go for a walk where if he pulled and saw a squirrel, he felt my body weight behind him, and he knew it was me, so he was fine with that. And then we gradually worked up to just attaching very light things on the back of the harness, <laughs> sorry, um, by attaching very light weights where it didn't bother him at all. And then eventually he's very uh, driven by me. And so I literally just have to stand in front of him and say, Rigel, come. And he will pull whatever it takes to come to me. And he loves it. Um, if there's any other person in the area when he is pulling he tends to gallop towards that person so it, because he just loves people. And so it's, it's a lot of fun for him because he gets to just run to someone and <laughs> pull all of this weight behind him. Wow. That's fascinating. Uh, Senator Westrom, <laughs> let's, let's keep it going, man. <laughs> so when you say a sled, uh, the mystery that goes through my mind, are you talking a sled on snow so it's easier to pull? Or is it a sled like they do at the tractor pulls at the county fair and <laughs> you're pulling on dirt? Uh, excellent question, Senator Westrom. Uh, Dr. Maynard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. So <laughs> it's actually three different surfaces that you can be uh, title, you can title in. Um, so you can do it on wheels. Uh, you can do it on like turf or grass. It doesn't have to be real grass. It can just be astroturf. And then you can also do it on snow. Um, Rigel is a short-coated breed. Uh, so mostly Nordic breeds will do this, but because he's shorted, shorter coated, he does not do winter. <laughs> and so we usually do his in summer. So he's only titled on wheels and on turf because he will absolutely not move in snow. <laughs> Members, any other questions, comments for Dr. Maynard or her dog? Uh, uh, Senator Dornick. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to speak to all at once, just uh, how great your testimonies have been and just uh, what you guys do. And we're really grateful for the service. And I tell you what, uh, I feel pretty good about uh, the, what the Board of Animal Health in good hands for each and every one of you. So it's a pleasure, again, to, to hear your testimonies and your work. And uh, thank you so much for your work. So Dr. Maynard, you're off the hook. Um, but I'd, I'd like to echo Senator Dornick's comments and say, you know, it's days like this that make me really love my job. You get to learn really cool things about really cool people doing really cool things. Um, and so um, I, I think I, I speak with some confidence that the rest of the committee feels this way as well, that we're grateful for you to spend the time with us, educating us about your backgrounds and the things that you do. Um, and we're confident uh, that the state of Minnesota is in good hands because of your dedication and your expertise. So um, I personally want to thank you uh, for being here today and for all the work that you do. Uh, it's incredibly important and it's clear that you people really care uh, and that you, you really do the work. And so thank you for all of the above. Um, any other last comments or Senator Dames? Well, Mr. Chair, I move to recommend that the appointment of Erica Swatsky, Dr. Peggy Ann Hawkins, Dr. Jessica Copian Fox, Alex Stade, Steve Neal, Brandon Schaefer, and Dr. Abigail Maynard to the Board of Animal Health to be confirmed.
Senator Dames moves uh, the slate of candidates to be confirmed for the Board of Animal Health. Members, do you have any questions or, or concerns about the um, motion uh, before the body? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, I'd just like to echo uh, your comments and uh, Senator Dornick and uh, uh, voice my appreciation for everyone that serves on the board. And uh, to, to some of the earlier testimony we heard, just these are real people doing real things. And uh, that's what the board is made up of. That's the experience and expertise you bring to it. And uh, I feel good about uh, the board and the hands it's in and the direction it is in the expertise you all bring. And uh, I know, uh, Chair Swatsky, I've been to your farm, and uh, uh, you know the struggles of agriculture just like everyone else we heard from as well. And so uh, I just appreciate that, and uh, I just think it's a moment where this is what, this is what we do, and uh, this is how our boards run and how they run good when we have good people on them. And uh, I think we've got a slate of very good people. Thank you, members. Um, to the motion uh, ahead of us now, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> Thanks, TV. Uh, the slate is approved. Um, um, uh, folks, just so you know, the next step is we're sending you all as one package to the floor of the Senate, uh, where we, I will briefly present your expertise, and um, the Senate as a whole will vote on your confirmation, and then you'll be confirmed. Uh, just so you know, I'm not, I can't tell you when that's going to happen. Not because I'm keeping it as a secret, but because I don't know. Uh, members, our next meeting will be um, Monday, April 8th. We have Senate File 5125, which is a Kunish, uh, Senator Kunish uh, bill. Senate File 5049, which is me. Uh, Senate File 5308, which is also me. Senate File 4069, which is Senator Dornick. All of these bills will be laid over. Um, uh, so there you go. There you have it. Uh, there being no further business before the committee, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>